Hey guys, I just want to make a quick video to showcase how you can use Antler with Go. Uh, this is something that I have been using every time I've been tinkering with making my own programming language because writing a parser from scratch, it's, it's good to do once or twice so that you understand how a parser works, but in general, it's just more hassle than it's worth. So the first thing you'll need, obviously, is going to be Antler. You can just go to uh, their official website and then click download. The actual download link is this little box here. There may be more on the page, but you see they also show you what other targets they support. So what I'm showing here, I'm specifically going to show you how to build it with Go, but in principle, it should be a very similar process, at least to generate the parser for these other languages. Actually implementing like a visitor might be a bit more work, but I'm sure that there's plenty of documentation you can use here. So I've already downloaded Antler and I've placed it in like a, a custom binary folder. It's literally just a jar though that's just sitting in my file system. So I have an example project here where I have a lexer grammar and a parser grammar and some other stuff. So let's quickly take a look at that. If we take a look at our lexer grammar, the actual details aren't too important. I assume if you're watching this video, you're at least vaguely familiar with Antler, so you should have some concept of the grammar. But what matters is how we how we actually uh, convert this into Go code. So we just have a little bit of a lexer and a little bit of a parser. And I have a build.bash here, and this is basically it. So I tend to run into problems with aliases inside of bash scripts. So, and instead of actually like fixing that problem the right way, I'd rather just make a variable that showcases where um, antler is. So I just have a command that will run this jar file with its actual path. But here's the meat and potatoes, I, I guess. You essentially just call antler, but you provide a dash D language equals argument. And then I assume this will work for basically every other target that they have. And then you can just pass in each of your grammars. If you want to do, if you want to create a visitor, which you likely will, although maybe not always, you'll probably know if you want to. If you're making something like a compiler, you probably will. Then you can just also give the visitor flag when you're compiling your parser. And I like to just place these into a folder called parser. Now I'm going to run this, but it's not actually going to do anything really. But let's take a look at what would have happened. So it would generate this folder called parser and in it, you'd see all of this junk except the thing at the very bottom, but I'll explain that in a moment. So the tool will just build Go code, and you don't really have to care about what's actually in these uh, files, but your entire parser is built through these, including the visitor. Now, the visitor you might want to take a look at because this is how you're going to actually implement it. When you build a visitor, you see that this is an interface, and so you just have to implement the interface on some type. You see in Go's case, everything returns an empty interface. In modern Go, you can just call this an any. Any is just an alias for an empty interface. And I'd recommend using any just for, you know, it's three letters and it's more readable. But ultimately, these can just return anything. And then you can use type assertions or reflection to figure out what they return. It's not as ideal as being able to set a custom type. Maybe there's a way, but I haven't found one. But it's not really a big deal, and I'll show you why in a second. But you see that all of my parsing um, rules, I guess, have their own visit uh, method in this interface. What I've also manually added, I wrote this, I added a util file into my parser, and all this is for, well, there's a few things it's for. This, all of this stuff up here, Sem uh, it's simply an error handler because I didn't like the fact that if Antler had a lot of errors, it would just spit out a lot of different things. So I create a custom error handler just for some basic stuff. And in the future, I may add more detail into this, but this will simply use a listener in order to panic after the first error. That's just one small thing, but the more important thing is down here. I have a custom parse function. So rather than doing all of this manually, because especially if you're testing, if you're testing your compiler, then you're going to have to call 
all of these things very often. So what I'm doing, this defer func up here simply handles the syntax errors that I threw. Well, I, I threw, I panicked uh, doing this. Uh, this isn't really like ideal, I say, I'd say, because this is kind of like I'm trying to mimic exceptions, but it's really, I think it's all right. It's basically just so that if there's a syntax error, the whole system stops. Because the thing with Antler is, you kind of have to do something like this because it's designed for Java, meaning it's just more object oriented in nature. Like there isn't, it's not built for errors as return values. So in order to break from the whole thing, as far as I know, you basically just need to throw a panic. You just need to panic, which means in order to recover from a panic, I have to just do things this way, which it's fine. And you see if it's not a syntax error, so some other thing happened with a panic, then I'll just actually panic again. But otherwise, here's how you actually use your parser. What you do is you start by creating a uh, new lexer. The name of it's going to depend on what you named your grammar file. So in my case, it's links. I call my language links, and the, the files are links lexer and links parser. So it will generate this function called new and then your grammar name. And it takes an input. What an input is, is it's a pointer to an antler uh, input stream. And to be clear, when I say antler, it's this specific um, package. It's antler for version four. So that's important to know. You create your new lexer. To manage all the error handler stuff, I remove all existing error handlers and then I add my custom error handler. But if you don't care about that, you would just run this when you to create a lexer. Then what I do is I make a token stream so that I can actually get the tokens out of the lexer. I'm just using the default token channel. Theoretically, that implies that there's non-default ones that you could use. I have no idea what that does or how it works, but you can look into that if you're interested. And then similarly, we just make a parser and we pass it all that, well, we pass it the token stream. Similarly, I remove the error handler and add a new one. And then you have to say parser dot, and then you call your top level parsing rule. So if I go back into the grammar, I went the wrong way. You see that the top level rule I call file statement because I like to conceptualize, okay, the whole file is one statement and it's just a file statement, which is just a bunch of other statements, but you could call it parse. You could call it whatever you like, but in order to start parsing, you simply call that and what that will return is essentially a tree node, but it's a specific one. It's going to return this interface file statement context thing. It auto generates. And it's kind of that simple. Now these input streams for antler, these could be files, but they could also be strings. So I have an example here that I use a little bit where it's simply, it's a function that will just take in a string. It will, create an input stream from the string and then pass it to parse and then return the result. I may in the future when I'm actually reading directly from files, I'll probably have a parse file, which will do something similar. It would probably take in the file path and then it would probably, I imagine it would open it. It would create a new input stream and then it would return everything the same, but that's basically it. And I just decided to throw this in the parse so that I don't have to do all of this uh, manually every single time, all of those lines. Now we can look at the visitor. So in my case, I'm calling it a translator because instead of, instead of like visiting this tree and then printing the code, what I'm doing is I'm taking an AST in my language and I'm producing another AST in C. And then that AST can be emitted as actual C code because I, I read on Reddit that this was a good idea. I love the phrasing of that. That's really crazy. There, it was an interesting discussion, but it did seem to make sense where it makes sense to transfer an AST into another AST and then print things out. Because if you're trying to convert things that aren't one to one, it's really hard to go straight from an AST into text. But anyway, here is how we implement a visitor. Again, Antler is very object oriented, so you need to use a structure for this. But I do also have a function similarly so that it can just take a tree and produce a, a um, 
In this case, I'm calling it a C node, but you can also think of that as its own tree, but for C. Now to make your visitor, you simply give it a name, struct, and then you have to inherit from this base, in my case, links parser visitor. And so long as you uh, built the grammar with the visitor flag, you should have access to this. Then you simply will implement a ton of things. In fact, let's take a look again at the visitor generation. So base visitors do this. And this is the thing that we're actually inheriting from. And the reason we inherit from the base visitor is so that you don't have to implement every single method in order for this to work. Since this has default methods on it, this will simply just visit the children of each of the nodes by default. So if you want to implement your parser, or I suppose your visitor, in parts without doing the whole thing at once, especially if you wrote the entire grammar of a language and you want to test little bits at a time, you'd want to implement from the, the base uh, links visitor instead of the interface um, visitor, which would be here. Yeah, so look for the one that says base on it because that's probably going to be simpler. I don't think there's very much else, so let's go back to the translator. You see I also have this visit method. And the reason for this is simply for simplicity's sake. Because if we add this method so that we can visit um, anything, then we don't have to say tree.accept all the time. It's a lot easier. I really just like this sort of mentality where you can say your visitor dot visit any sort of context. It doesn't matter what node it is. You can just visit it like that. And this whole thing will just be handled through this. So that's why I have that. And it, let's take a look at how I'm doing the return types because you see all of these methods return any. Every single one of them is just an any because like I said, it returns an empty interface. I have a result type, which will simply pass up like when I say kind, the actual details of my language aren't that important. But when I say kind, this is just the return type. It's just type as a keyword and go. And then I return up a node and I or I return an error. And then I have some instances where, OK, if it's if it's good, right, then we can just return it with no error or we can fail and we can return an error. And simple things like that. And using go, I can just make it so that as long as every single visit method returns some kind of result, then it doesn't matter where this came from. Every time I visit, I can just say, I can declare that this thing's a result. If it's not a result, then Go will panic. But because I'm making sure everywhere that it is a result, then that's fine. It doesn't matter. I don't even need to check. I can just say, this is a result. And then I can check errors, and then I can propagate them up if I need to. And this allows me to use this object-oriented sort of structure created by Antler, but I can still use um, errors as return values. And ultimately, it means I can just have this one function here, this essentially pure function that just takes an input and produces an output. And it doesn't matter how the implementation is defined. I actually really like using Antler in Go compared to using it in Kotlin or Java, just because even though it's somewhat hacky in a way, it does just feel so much simpler to me where, oh, we want to visit this. It's just one method. That's it. And it's like very simple. So for example, visiting numbers, right? All I do is I get the text out of a token. I check if it contains a, de a period, because if it does, then it's actually a float, but otherwise it's an int, and that's it. It's very simple. So hopefully this is useful to you. If you want to check out this actual code base, I guess I'll link it in the description. But otherwise, hopefully uh, this helps you with your code, and presumably this is pretty comparable to if you're targeting other languages too. The actual implementation details are just going to be a little bit different, but you can just check the documentation. So I hope this helps you guys. I'll see you in the next video.